We're going to be reading today out of the book of Hebrews. I don't know if any of you know much about the book of Hebrews or have spent time in the book of Hebrews, but Hebrews is a book of decisions. Hebrews is a book that we come to a place where it's time to make the decision. Hebrews is very black and white and it, and it talks about who do you believe, what do you believe, and what are you going to stand on? It's time to decide. So as I've been studying the book of Hebrews, and I was blessed to find out that Pastor Valencia also has been studying the book of Hebrews, the Lord brought to my attention specifically, if you want to turn with me, Hebrews chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 35 through 39. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. I want you to underline the word promise. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. Underline, live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. This is the best part. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. But of those who believe and are saved. I want you to underline, believe and are saved. The title of my message today is Put the King on the Throne. The other week I was on the stair climber and I have a regimen um, that, that obviously I spend a lot of time on the stair climber that it's against my will. If you want to be honest, I'm not a fan of the stair climber and, and I have a regimen and I'm to be on this stair climber for 60 minutes. And um, most people I think know that usually when you're doing a workout like that, the first 30 is kind of your warm up. And so then you get to a place where after the 30 minutes, then that's when the real work sets in. And so I'm on this stair climber and I'm about halfway through and I'm tired. I am dead tired. I've been going. I, I, I had worked out prior to that. And I'm on this stair climber. And the mistake I made at that moment halfway through is I started to look at the 30 minutes I still had to go versus what I had already done. And I started to focus on how much further I had to go to accomplish my goal versus how far I had already come. And I started to get weary and I contemplated shrinking back. And, and as I'm in this moment and I listen to worship music as I work out, it gets me really amped up. And I was listening to worship music and, and as I look at my stair climber and I climbed like a hundred floors by then. And as I'm looking at, at this thing, I see in the middle of the stair climber a bright, huge red octagon. And in bold letters, in capital bold letters, it says, stop and i thought about that for a second i thought you know i've done pretty good i've been diligent i could push the stop button and and all of the pain and i could i could be done push this off right there there's no cool down i just done but at the moment that i was contemplating pushing that stop button this song comes on my ipod it's called the anthem and it's by Planet Shakers. And I don't know if any of you know that song, but it'll rock your world if you listen to it. I love it. And I'm listening, <clears throat> excuse me, to this song. And in the first verse of that song, it says, Hallelujah, he has won the victory. And so I'm on the stair climber and I'm thinking, man, God, you're talking to me as I'm, what? And I'm thinking about this and I thought, what does that mean? What does that look like for him to win the victory? What does, what does that mean to me? And so I'm getting ready to, to contemplate this and the Lord is putting things in my mind. And he brought me back to the time when our savior was, was being tortured and whipped before he had to go walk the cross up to Calvary and, and I'm thinking about that and I'm, I'm getting tired and I'm weary and I'm looking at the stop button, but I'm thinking about the victory. Back then I was informed and I had learned that in order to put a man to whip him, they got whipped 50 times. So the whip that they had, it wasn't just a normal little whip, like a belt, you know, you just hit them and then off they go 50 times. You know, you have your punishment. The whip had shards in it that would actually remove the flesh from your back. 
It would remove the skin off of your body every single time, 50 times. And by the 50th lash, usually they could pronounce you dead. That was about time where you couldn't take any more. But for Jesus, they hated him so much that they lashed him 49 times just so that they could continue to torture him some more. So after they removed the flesh from his back and lashed him 49 times, they proceeded to force him to carry his own cross up to Calvary. And I thought about that. And I thought about at any single moment, he had a stop button. At any single moment, Jesus could have said, Father, I'm done. You can take this all away. I've had enough. But see, he understood that if he pushed the stop button, that the prophecy wouldn't have been fulfilled and he wasn't going to claim victory anymore at that moment. So I was able to persevere understanding what my savior went through and I can't even handle a little bit of muscle pain and it encouraged me and it strengthened me knowing that my God had a stop button but he loved me enough to endure it he loved me enough to say I love these people God they're your people and I will obey you because his assignment was to put the king on the throne and in order to do that, he had to go through a process that wasn't fun and he had to be tortured and, and publicly disgraced and spat upon. But he understood what his assignment was and he loved the king more than he, than he cared about the pain for it. Nothing that we do, no strength that we can cultivate comes without resistance. Whether you're in the gym, whether it's spiritual resistance, any time that, that the devil's tempting you and you feel resistance, start praising because that's about the time you're about to be strengthened. That's an opportunity that we have to place God on the throne. Any time that you feel resistance in your life, that's God saying, here I am, let me strengthen you. And James, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you are tested, because why? It, it cultivates perseverance. It produces a fight. It produces strength in you. Nothing is stronger without resistance. And I've learned that at the young age of 25, I've had a lot of resistance in my life. I can't tell you that I consider it joy yet, but I understand that it's for my benefit. I want to share with you some things I believe remove the king from the throne. The first thing that the Lord was speaking to, and there's many different things. These are just some things that he, he brought to the forefront of my mind. The first thing was idols. Idols. Anything that we place above God, anything that we run to, anything that we find comfort in when we want to shrink back and we begin to go to that thing instead of placing him on the throne as an idol in your life and that will remove you from his will. It will put distance between you and the king. Any idols, and I believe that the idol of self-reliance is a big one that I know myself I struggle with. I struggle with feeling like I can do it all on my own. God, I don't need you because you've answered all my prayers and I'm where I want to be so I can take it from here. Thank you for that, but now I can take it from here. And every time I found myself in a place where I took it from there, God ripped it from me. I moved back from Phoenix, Arizona a few years ago and I had everything I wanted in Phoenix, Arizona. I had a job I loved, I had friends I loved, I had a church I loved, I had a home I loved. I was self-sufficient. Now there's nothing wrong with being self-sufficient, but when you find yourself sustaining yourself in the name of God, that's not being God-reliant. And so I was self-sufficient and God asked me to come back to Washington and I was floored and I was confused. I was angry. I didn't want to come back here. Spokane at that time for me was a place of pain and brokenness and bad memories. And it was not something that I was actually trying to get away from. I never dealt with it. I wanted to get away from it. And God asked me to come back here. And I reluctantly moved back to Washington 
And I felt like I was actually taking a step back. I felt like I was abandoning and aborting what God had already asked me to do. And so I was confused. I had no understanding. And, and when I got to Spokane for a week, I didn't even unpack my car. And I cried because I didn't want to be here. Because I thought I knew what I wanted. And even though the things I wanted were still of God, did it really match up with what God said he had for my life? For months, I was isolated. About two months, I was completely isolated. I didn't have friends. I didn't have a job. Actually, believe it or not, I got fired from the job I came back to because I was changed. Because I would rather have spent time with God that they said I was so different. I, they didn't want me around. I never actually felt honored to be fired until that moment. I didn't have a job. I had nothing. And I, my parents graciously gave me gas money to put in my car. And I would go pray up at Cliff Park. For hours, I would go pray. It was the only place I found any type of, of refuge. I didn't want to listen to the TV. I didn't want to put on my radio. I didn't want to watch movies. I didn't want to hang out. I wanted to be with God. And I had so many questions for God. And I was angry with God. And I was mad at God because the things that he had told me about my life weren't panning out for me. And, and I was confused because I thought I was obedient. And so I spent time in prayer and I worshiped him and I, and I sought him. And I came to a place where things hadn't changed yet. And I was in the car praying. And I, was, I was weeping. And I said, Father, what do you want me to do? What do you want from me? I've done everything you've asked me to do. What do you want from me? And in that moment, he whispered to me. And I love when God whispers, because if he's whispering, it's he's close to you. If God has to yell at you, it's because there's a distance. But when God's close to you, you'll hear his whisper. And he whispered to me and he said, Ali, you're doing it right now. You're exactly where I want you to be. You're putting me on the throne of your life, and that is your assignment. You are a daughter of the king, and your job is to glorify my name. And when you were in Phoenix, Arizona, you had everything you needed, so you didn't need to glorify me, even though it was in my name and you were in church, but you were doing it because you knew how to do it. You did it because you were comfortable doing it. You did it because it brought you comfort, but it really had nothing to do with me. It was because it's what you knew how to do. So I had to remove that from you and take you to a place where you can glorify me with nothing. How can I trust you to glorify me when you have everything if you can't glorify me when you have nothing? And so I'm in my car and all of a sudden I got this peace that transcends all understanding. And I understood what my assignment was. Put the king on the throne. We can't do it on our own. You'll turn to Matthew. Or I'm sorry, John 15, 5. I want to turn there first. John 15, 5. It says this, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear fruit, much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. It doesn't say less. It says nothing. He is the source and we are the branches. So our assignment is to grow the source, to tap into the source, the unlimited supply we are the branches, but apart from that source, you have nothing. Apart from water, a tree can't grow. We need to tap into the source. The Bible tells you right there, apart from him, you can do nothing. It's not confusion. It's not gray matter. It's black and white. I'm thankful that our Bible is so black and white. The second thing that I also struggle with that the Lord spoke to me about that removes him from the throne is unforgiveness. I battle with unforgiveness. I've been wronged intentionally. I have had people persecute me intentionally. I have been lied about. I have been gossiped about. 
I have people who, who purposely have tried to hurt me and, and force me to shrink back. And I had an entitlement to be mad. I had an entitlement to not forgive them because I didn't wrong them. They wronged me. It's their job to come to me. But the Bible clearly says in Matthew, you forgive 70 times, seven times. That's like all the time every day for the rest of your life. I don't know about you, but that's really hard for me. And when I get hurt, I bail. That's my, that's my protection mode. When I feel like I've been wronged, I'm out. And I start harboring unforgiveness because I was wrong. And, and what happens is we get so focused on the offense of the matter, we forget who the source is. We forget that God has called us to forgive those. Unforgiveness hardens our heart to God's word in our life. Unforgiveness hardens our heart to God's voice in our life. Unforgiveness will do more damage to you than it will do to the person who needs it. Unforgiveness will remove God from the throne in your life. I'm thankful that we have a God who forgives us 70 times 7 a day. I'm thankful I have a God that when I removed him from the throne in my life, sometimes intentionally, he loves me enough and he forgives me and gives me grace. We are called to forgive. And by forgiving, we put him on the throne. The third thing that removes God from the throne is pride. I believe that pride breeds from insecurity. I believe that pride comes from a place when we feel inadequate or if we don't really understand our place, we create one and we, we become prideful in that thing. And the irony of pride is I, I also believe we can be prideful in our humility. Right? So we, we can say, I go to church every Sunday and Wednesday. I lift my hands in worship. I'm, I'm clapping, I'm praising, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I'm not at the bar, I, 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 I. Pride is about me, it's not about him. God hates pride. Pride focuses you on you and it's not about us. It's about what he wants to do through us. If you'll turn in your word to me to James chapter four. Verse four through six, and it's the end of six that I want to focus on. James four, four through six, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world, pride, is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we can come to a place where we can say, Father, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't feel adequate. God, I'm not equipped for this thing. Father, this is bigger than me. He even tells us, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to see you through that thing. But the minute that you do it on your own and the minute that you become self-sufficient, I don't have protection for that anymore. I oppose that because that's the opposite of me. If you're so full of you, there's no more room for me. So how can you ask me to help you if you don't understand that that? You can't do it on your own. He gives grace to the humble. We need to be humble and understand that our job and our position is down here so we can put him on the throne. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the book of Daniel, back in that time, they were under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a yucky prideful man he loved idolatry and and he loved himself and he loved he he was just loved the world and he commanded his people to serve the god of his choice to bow down to the god of his choice and shadrach meshach and abednego said heck no over my dead body literally 
And he said, okay, well, anyone that doesn't want to bow down to my God is going to be put in the fire. How about that? And they said, perfect. Because even if you do put me in that fire, even if, even if you try to instill fear to make me serve your God, we still won't bow down to your God. And my God will see us through. So he puts them in the fire and he's a little confused because he's watching these three men stand there with flames and, and they're, they're just standing there. And he's a man of really large power. And he's thinking this is not the way this was supposed to go. So he turns it up. He turns it up to the highest heat it can go. There's no, there's no human way possible, no physical way possible. These men are standing there. But why? They put the king on the throne. And they said, even if he doesn't, we will never bow down to your God. And we will serve my God and glorify him. Even if he doesn't save us, he's still God. Because it's not a matter of whether he can or can't. It's a matter of whether he will or won't. He's still our God. And even if he doesn't, I still won't bow down to your God. They had an anointing in that moment, a protection in that moment, because they glorified the king of kings and put him in his rightful place on the throne. And they walked out of that fire unharmed. There's a few things that I also feel the Lord has spoken to me about how in my life personally, and I believe we all can participate, is to place him on the throne. Three things we can do to place him on the throne. The first thing that, that I has rocked my world is that when we turn our battlegrounds into holy ground, when you claim spiritual authority over the battles in your life, they become under the authority of God and they are not under the power of the devil. Power and authority are different. The devil has the power of influence. God has authority and a final word and final say over all things. Parents, when you ground your children, that's authority. You have that final authority over your offspring to say, no, you're staying here. But what put them there was the power of influence that caused them to make a bad decision. But you had the authority that overrode that influence that said, no, you're going to stay right where I've put you. When we start claiming spiritual authority and laying our things and our burdens and our trials at God's feet, the devil no longer has dominion because he can't be where God is. He can't have influence over what God has already said is his. Turn your battleground into holy ground. We put on the garment of praise. When it's hard and you don't know how you're going to pay your mortgage payment tomorrow, you put on the garment of praise because I guarantee you God will give you the things you need. You put on the garment of praise and put him in his rightful place. It's not about us. It's not about our comfort. It's not about what we have or don't have. It's not about how much money we have in the bank because I guarantee you he gave it to you and he'll take it away not about making our earthly life comfortable for us because we don't even belong here in the first place we put on the garment of praise the second thing that i believe glorifies god and puts him on the throne is when we walk in our assignment when we walk in our assignment we are given an anointing to do that thing now, we're all called. Every single one of us has a divine purpose and a divine destiny and a value on your life and an assignment. Every single one of us. And when we dedicate that assignment to spiritual authority, we are given an anointing to complete and walk out that assignment. You, are, you have a protection that is placed around you to ensure that you are going where you need to go. I want to share with you a story about a young child named Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was 10, 11 years old. She was a child. And her assignment, she was given an assignment called to battle at 10, 11 years old. And her assignment was to put the French king on the throne. That was her assignment at 10, 11 years old. 
And she was a great warrior for a number of reasons. She was small, so she could go into places easily, quickly, being hidden. She could spy. She could relay information. She was obedient. She didn't do things that she was told not to do. She did exactly what they told her. She was quick. She was skilled. She was smart. She was a child, and she did that assignment. She completed that and put the French king on the throne. But what happened was... Is after she completed that assignment, she had that protection for her to get that assignment done. She had other people ensuring that she was doing safely what she needed to do. But what happened was that the pride set in in her and she realized that she really liked all the praise she was getting for what she was doing. And she thought, wow, I'm pretty good at this. And she started taking the credit and the, the praise for her assignment. And so she wanted to keep going. So she kept going after the king was already placed on the throne. And it's so unfortunate because after that was done, she was brutally, brutally killed. Her protection was gone. Because she wasn't called to keep going. She was called to her assignment. And the minute that she stepped out of her assignment, her protection was gone. We are called to our assignment. And at the end of the day, no matter how God uses it in you, we are called to put the king on the throne and we step out of that. When we move to the right or to the left, and when we start searching here or searching there, or when we start feeling like we can do it on our own and God, I've done enough now, so it's my turn, our protection and our anointing is gone. We are called to our assignment. And when we walk in that with humility, that puts God on the throne. The third thing that I believe places God on the throne is surrender. How many of you love to lift your hands and worship? I love stuff. I can't even help it. I am, I'm always crazy. I love lifting my hands and worship. What I found out was lifting your hands is a sign of surrender. When you raise your hand, that's a sign of surrender. When we come to God and we say, Father, I can't do this thing. I surrender. It's bigger than me. Help me find a strategy in your name, in your power, with your resources. When we surrender, God gives us a grace. If you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter one, verse five. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we gain knowledge when we live a life of surrender. I believe that we gain anointing and protection when we live a life of surrender. I believe when we lay our battlegrounds at God's feet, and we all have different battlegrounds, but when we surrender to him, I believe that we can gain in our knowledge of who he is. When we lift our hands to him and we know that we can't do it anymore because we weren't carried, we, were, we weren't designed to do it all. That's why I don't, I don't always agree with the statement that says God will never give you more than you can handle because I know for a fact God's usually given me much more than I can handle. And the reason is because I don't have a choice now but to go to him. He keeps me in a state of surrender. But 
I asked for it. On my own, I wouldn't just choose in some of my situations to surrender, but I remember asking God to help me surrender. Coming back from Phoenix, Arizona, I had to surrender what I thought I wanted. I had to surrender what I thought God wanted. I had to stop playing God in my own life. I never would have imagined I would have been where I am right now, but I had to surrender. I had to surrender my goals, my dreams, my ambitions. Not that they weren't good, but they didn't match up with the word of God for what he had for my life. And quite frankly, I don't think I really ever consulted him too much on it because I just assumed I was in the will of God because I was in church. That doesn't mean you're in the will of God. Church doesn't redeem you. The act of sitting in church doesn't redeem us. Surrender to God's word over your life is what brings redemption. Saying, God, I surrender. I understand that you died for me and I have faith in what you promised. And I will not shrink back, but I will persevere in the things that you have called me to do no matter the cost. And what happens is when we can surrender what we're comfortable with, when we can surrender what we know or what we think we know or the plans that we have, God lights a match under you. He lights a match under that thing because it no longer is about us. It's about him. And God loves to be worshiped and he loves to be praised. And that is our job. That is our job is to put the king on the throne. I believe with my entire being that your heart for God will take you further than your gift or your skill ever will. Your heart for God will take you further than your gift ever can. Your gift is from God in the first place. Your gift isn't your assignment. Your heart for God and honoring who he is is your assignment. And through that, he will use your gift. But all too often, we rely on our gifts. And our assignment is to put the king on the throne. I feel very strongly right now just to pray for those of us that have unforgiveness in our hearts. I was in a situation last night. I had an event for my foundation, the Esther Generation at the Davenport Hotel. And I've been very busy uh, with travel and getting ready for my uh, upcoming event. And so I placed a lot of trust in um, my partner of my foundation. And I said, I trust you to take on this. I know that you know what my heart is. You understand what my vision is. I trust you. I trust your discernment. I trust your judgment. And I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually walking into a battleground last night. And my name is attached to this, this event. And it had a fashion show and fashion shows are fine. But what happened was, is the attire and the clothing was actually representing the very thing that I was trying to stop. And I was so angry. I was filled with anger and I wanted everything inside of me wanted to go up and stop the whole entire thing but what god said to me is i defend you and i am bigger than this and i was angry and i felt as though god was being mocked but god cannot be mocked we read about that in galatians god will not be mocked and so i had to turn that battleground into a holy ground and i just surrendered that thing to him and all these thoughts started going through my head man what if somebody starts thinking this about us or what if someone thinks that i am for that or you know and all of these thoughts started coming into my head for me to battle but it wasn't my battle 
My job was to turn that battleground into a holy ground. And the Lord reminded me that he defends and that he will justify whatever it is that he wants to be done because his will will be done. And I had to deal with a little bit of unforgiveness because I was angry. I was very angry. And I just feel really strongly that there's some of us in here that need to surrender our unforgiveness. That we have been wronged intentionally. People have spoken out against you intentionally. People have turned their back on you intentionally and you did nothing to deserve it. And you feel entitled. I feel entitled to be mad, to be hurt, to feel wronged, to shrink back. But God says, no, we are not of those who shrink back. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And I just feel so strongly right now in the name of Jesus, God, I just ask that your spirit come in this place and that you give us a heart of surrender, Father. Jesus, that you are moving in the hearts that are harboring unforgiveness. Whether it be God for a loved one, a family member, a mother, a father, a pastor, friend. God, it says that all have fallen short. Every single one of us has fallen short. And that the devil wants us to shrink back and abort our assignment. God, I pray for you to start cultivating a heart of forgiveness, that we can extend love to those who have hurt us, that we can be more filled with you and that our hearts do not turn hard to what it is that you have for our life. Jesus, that our hearts do not become hardened to your voice in our life. But God, that we are constantly, constantly picking up our cross and putting you on the throne where only you belong. I pray that you help me with forgiveness where I need it. That you help me learn how to love those who persecute me and not just stay away from them. Father, I pray that you forgive me for the moments where I have removed you from the throne of my life. And you help me to constantly constantly glorify your name in all that I do. Rid me of pride. Rid me of the, the easy mindset of self-reliance. Remove that idol in my life. Help me be a daughter of the king who lives to glorify her father above all things. I pray your spirit upon your people, Jesus. As you are touching every single heart in this room and that you are dealing and healing with the broken pieces that they have been entitled to carry. But you have said no more. Today is the day that I am coming and I am bringing healing and restoration. You have carried this for far too long and it is damaging you and you are my son and you are my daughter and I have not called you to carry a burden that doesn't belong to you. I pray for the hearts of the people that we need to forgive. That you're working in their hearts and you're softening their hearts. Jesus, I pray that when we leave here today, that we don't just leave with, with a good notion or side note. But Father, your word is living and active inside of us. And that when people encounter us, they encounter you. That we don't walk out on the street and just see strangers passing by. 
We don't just see someone who's down and out and hope that they get better. But Father, that we take initiative to put you on the throne. That you give us a heart to see this city and the people of this city as your son and your daughter. Not just the people that live here, but God, they are your children. You give us a heart for your children, Jesus. That they can experience your love and the gift of who you are and your freedom, God, in their life. And that they would never be the same. God, I thank you that when your spirit comes on to us, God, that we are never the same. When we encounter you, when we walk with you, God, there is nothing like walking with Jesus in freedom. There is nothing like being surrendered to you. You gave it all so we could have you. God, that you would just leave us in a constant state of surrender. And that we would maximize every opportunity we have to glorify your name and to put you on the throne in our life. We praise you, Jesus. We lift you high. In your heavenly name we pray.